Welcome to What That Means with Camille. In this series, Camille asks top technical experts to explain, in plain English, commonly used terms in their field. Here is Camille Moorhart. Hi, and welcome to today's podcast, What That Means, part of In Technology. I have with me today Andres Rodriguez. He is a fellow at Intel, and it knows pretty much everything there is to know about deep learning, which is going to be the topic of focus today. Welcome, Andres. Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure being here. So can you define deep learning for us for people who aren't so familiar with it and also its relationship in the broader AI or artificial intelligence that I think almost everybody has heard of? Yeah, so deep learning is a branch of machine learning, and it is the branch that has grown exponentially over the past decade. The reason for deep learning is because it has multiple layers. And what I mean by a layer is multiple transformations. So the way machine learning typically works is you have some input data, like for example, let's suppose you're trying to predict the price of a home. And so you have a bunch of data about the features of the home, like the number of rooms, the size of the home, et cetera. And you take these features about the home, and then you put it through a machine learning algorithm, and the output is a price. Or it can be a classification problem where the output is, this is a good home, a bad home, or a medium home, a rating, for example. And in machine learning algorithms, you take your input data and you do some processing. You pass it through a machine learning algorithm that transforms the data into the output. And in traditional machine learning, you can also think of this as, as a shallow deep learning where you only do a few transformations to the, to the data input in order to come up with the output. In deep learning, you have multiple layers of transformations that you're doing to the input data. And what's cool about deep learning is you can actually put the raw data or close to the raw data as input into your deep learning model to come out with the output. And so to differentiate this from traditional machine learning, for example, take a problem of image classification where you pass as an input a set of pixels that correspond to an image. In the past, you had to do some feature extractions. You require somebody that had expertise in computer vision to extract features about the image, and then you would pass those features into the machine learning algorithm. But today, having multiple layers in your deep learning model, you can pass the raw pixels. Sometimes you might do some normalization with the pixels. But besides that, you pass the raw or almost raw pixels into the model and out comes the, the class of the model. So for example, this is a cat or a person or fruit, et cetera. And this has been possible more recently because of the computational advancements. So you can train larger models, deeper models, as well as access to much larger data sets which are needed in order to train the multiple layers that deep learning models have. What are the limitations to the deep learning model? I think you just said one, right? It requires a lot of data. That's right. So one is large amounts of data, although there are ways around that, and I'll talk about those in a moment. Another one is large amounts of computations, but again, there are some ways around that as well. And the ways around that is nowadays, there are very large models that are being trained from scratch. So you take a model, usually in the beginning, the model is composed of weights that are random. And as you go through multiple iterations of the training, then the model converges. Now this requires a lot of data and, and a lot of compute. But once, once you have a trained model, let's suppose you want to use that model for a similar application, not exactly the same one that it was trained for, but but one that shares some of the similar characteristics. What you can do is you can take that already pre-trained model and apply a smaller data set that is specific for your 
problem that you're trying to solve, and and you can retrain it with the pre-trained model as a starting point. This is often called fine tuning or transfer learning. And this process requires less compute than when you're training a model from scratch. So the idea that you need humongous amounts of data and or humongous amounts of compute, it's only true when you're training large models from scratch, but it's, it's not true for multiple applications. There are a number of pre-trained models available in the open source do domains. Uh, there are many model zoos that you can pull from and do fine tuning on these models for your particular problem that you're trying to solve. Can you give an example? Like what is an example of something where you might find a pre-trained model that you're gonna then fine tune? A problem that I did 10 years ago was taking a, a model that was trained on what is known the, as the ImageNet data set. Now this, by today, today's standard, this is a very small and toy problem. But back then it was the, the, the state of the art. So you take a model and you train it with a large data set for image classification. A data set that had a thousand classes, about a thousand samples per class, so roughly a million samples. And you train it through hundreds of thousands of iterations. And I'll explain in a moment what the training process involves. But then once you have the, the already trained model, what I used is I took the, the trained model and then I took a smaller data set that was composed of cars and people and a few other objects of interest that was a much smaller data set. And then I fine tuned that model with the smaller data set for an application that at that time I was interested in using. So then my, my model then was able to be deployed and was fine-tuned to just a few classes. At that point, it was four classes. Even though the original model was trained on, on a thousand classes with a million data set, the fine-tuning process was only four classes with um, a few hundred, hundreds of images rather than a million images. Nowadays, you can do fine-tuning for a number of applications like language applications, other computer vision applications and recommendation models. Now I mentioned how does the training process works. So just to give a quick high level overview for the audience, the way it typically works is you have data that is labeled. So a human took uh, so uh, the, a, a number of images and labeled one as cat, one as dog, et cetera. So, there is a label associated with every sample. And then you take a, a, a model, and as I mentioned, initially the model has random weights. So a model is just composed of, of weights organized in a particular architecture. Explain more about weights as, as you're going through here, really, what are those? So then you take the input image, you pass it through the various layers of the deep learning model, and the layers are essentially a number of nonlinear and linear transformations. And the linear transformations, as many in the audience may recall, a linear transformation is you take an input and you multiply it by a weight, sometimes you add a bias. And so the weights that make up the model are the weights in these linear transformations. And the biases are also considered weights in deep learning lingo. And then you take the output of the linear transformation and you apply a nonlinear transformation. Traditionally, it used to be a sigmoid function. Nowadays, a ReLU function is quite common. But the point is, after you pass the data through a number of linear and nonlinear transformations, then you get your output. Initially, the output is going to be essentially garbage because the model ha has not been trained well. But then you compare the output that you get with the expected output. And you know the expected output because a human labeled what the output should have been. And then you compute a measure of error, a metric of error. Then you backpropagate the error through the model in order to know how to adjust the model weight so that the error decreases. And you do this through uh, multiple iterations with all the samples. And you typically iterate more than once through the samples. Sometimes you might iterate uh, hundreds of times through the entire data set. Now, this is 
what's known as supervised learning. It's called supervised because a human somewhat supervised it in the sense that a human labeled the data samples using the training process. But nowadays, there are ways that are new, not new, but there's been a renewal of older methods where you take a data set that has not been labeled and you do some initial training and supervised training, and then you finish the training cycles with a smaller data set that is labeled. So you do this semi-supervised approach using both unlabeled data and labeled data. As you're back propagating the error or the weight, you said you're, you're going to push it now back up through the model so that the model can figure out where it got it wrong and fix that. Does a human know how the computer is making an adjustment? Like, oops, it looks like most cats have tails. So I was mistaken when I classified something as a cat most of the time if it doesn't have a tail or whatever. Like, is it something that a human can follow or does the data scientist not actually know how the model is correcting itself, how it's making that adjustment? So the human can track how the weights are being changed. And the propagation is just a bunch of linear algebra equations. So there is no, no magic behind that. There are ways observing how certain change in the weights affect the output. And it's typically not necessarily, hey, tail versus, versus, versus no tail. But, but a human, there are tools that can help you visualize changes in the weights in a particular layer, the effect that it's having on the model output. Although most data scientists, when they're training models, they don't necessarily examine this type of effects. They pass the data, they give the model some training parameters, and they are observing whether or not the error is decreasing over time, the number of iterations grow. So that's one of the key metrics that the data scientists tends to observe is this decrease in the training error. What is the real problem with data explainability? You can explain how certain changes in the weight generate an output or modify the output. But the weights themselves can be a bit mysterious. For example, when you design an, archi uh, an architecture, meaning a, a certain pattern of how the weights are going to be arranged, you don't necessarily have a, typically an intuition of, hey, these weights in this middle, in the middle of the neural network, these are going to control whether the image has a tail or not a tail. So this level of granularity, it's not something that the data scientist designs. And so this is part of the inexplicability of uh, deep learning. But uh, on the other hand, you get typically, if assuming you have access to sufficient data and compute, you tend to get higher performance. And so part of the debate has been, on the one hand, traditional machine learning models offer certain theoretical guarantees. Deep learning models do not typically have those same guarantees in performance, but the performance is, is better. The accuracy is better. Uh, so it might be more challenging to explain on the one hand. On the other hand, you get better performance. And so if, if you were to ask me, for example, would I rather go to a surgeon that is 80% successful, but, but can explain me exactly what goes right and wrong versus a surgeon that is 99% successful that cannot explain in detail why went right or wrong. I would choose the 99%, but I know there are mixed opinions in this debate. Deep learning has a lot of, I'll just say press right now. Do you think that there's going to be, over time, a convergence of AI approaches 
maybe into a handful of distinct ones, like maybe there's some sort of distributed learning, like federated learning, and then there's deep learning. Are we going to be moving toward one kind of model or a couple of kinds of models, like for central computing, we're going to do deep learning, and for decentralized, we're going to do federated? Or is the world and the industry in AI moving towards multiple, multiple different kinds of models for every different sort of approach, and it matters what you're doing? There are techniques to training a model, and there are techniques that are centralized, such as you're going to train everything in the cloud, and decentralized, that you might do some training on, on client, as you mentioned, using federated learning. And I think those will continue. Federated learning is, is important, particularly for security, when you don't want to put your data in the cloud. So both techniques will continue to gain popularity. The types of models that are getting trained have evolved. So initially, when deep learning was resurfaced uh, roughly 12 years ago, it particularly impacted the computer vision domain initially. And the types of models were known as convolutional neural networks. So convolutional neural networks, or CNNs, they became very, very popular until deep learning started expanding to the language domain. In the language domain, recurrent neural networks started to become much more popular. And these were not new networks, neither convolutional nor recurrent. These were very, very old types of networks. They were just resurfaced over the past decade for different applications. What has happened over the past three years is more of a convergence in the models towards a new type of architecture called transformer models. And so transformer models were initially used to replace recurrent neural networks in language models, but now they are expanding into the computer vision domain, traditionally dominated by convolutional neural networks, as well as recommendation systems. So I do see a convergence in the types of models. I don't think CNNs or convolutional neural networks or RNNs or recurrent neural networks will disappear, but I think transformers will become the dominant type of model across the various domains. And I don't think necessarily one type of transformer model, but the class of model, meaning the transformer model class, will become the dominant types of models. Now, the techniques to train the models, I think those will not necessarily converge, given that some compute will continue to be done in the cloud and other compute will be done at the edge. Do you think that models will be trained more in the future toward specialized functionality or like you even say, sort of pre-trained models that you can then fine tune? Or do you think things are going to gravitate more towards this artificial general intelligence, AGI, that we keep hearing about as kind of a holy grail in the media? I don't think they are mutually exclusive. I don't think you can take a, a large jump away from what we're doing in deep learning and all of a sudden get AGI. And there is actually debate on, on, in the community on whether AGI is, is possible. But to the first part of your question, I think what's going to happen is you're going to have these extremely large models that are going to be trained that have the capacity to be fine-tuned for various types of applications. And the reason I think this, this is the future is models are growing in size uh, and, and complexity at an extremely rapid pace. And most companies don't have the data or the resources to be training these models from scratch, but they do have the resources to fine tune them for their particular application. So I anticipate the future will be a few extremely large models trained by likely hyperscaler companies 
that have access to all that computer and data. And then those models might be either uh, be freely available or be uh, given with a fee for companies to then take them and, and fine tune them for their particular application. This is fascinating. Has this business model emerged yet that you can see? Not the renting out models widely. What has emerged is pre-trained models are put into model zoos repositories that are freely available on the one hand. On the other hand, some extremely large models are trained by a large company that then provides services directly based on those models. So rather than renting out the, the models, they provide APIs for end users to leverage those models. So this service or AI as a service, it's been growing. You said hyperscalers. So let's just define more specifically the kinds of companies that you think will be able to either rent out models or, or provide APIs or services based on their access to large quantities of data. How do they get that data? Why is that data going through them? So hyperscalers where people are often giving them lots of their own data to of the top of my head, you can think of Google, Amazon, uh, Meta, Microsoft, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, just to give a few examples. These companies have access to a lot of uh, both data from the end users. They have the resources to label large amounts of data. And most of them have huge data centers. So they have the computational capacity to, to train extremely large models from, from scratch. So this is data that's voluntarily provided to them. You're not talking about data that's just stored. Like I store my personal data in maybe a public cloud environment. Maybe I upload my photos, for example. We're not talking about that. We're talking about data that you voluntarily pass to them. How are they capturing that data? Is this me describing myself as I fill out a profile on social media, or how are they capturing it? I don't think they would touch data that you've stored. For example, if I'm at AWS and I put some of my photos in a server, I rent a server to put my personal data, I, I, I don't think they can use that, that data. I, but if I, for example, I'm leverage, le leveraging a service such as uh, Google Photos, for example, I would anticipate that Google can then take those photos to improve their face recognition algorithms, for example. Or if I enter my personal information into a media service, social media service, that then they can use that to train their models. So for example, if I give a number of updates in and, and write text in, in social media, that the social media company, it can leverage that text to, to train their algorithms. For a lot of these, we're talking a federated learning model, for example, where I was talking with Ashwin Ram at Google, who told me that you start to type, respond back to a text message, and it'll give you some pre-fill options. And those are all customized to you, right? So the pre-fill options are going to, after a while, they're really going to start to look like things that I personally type, and they would be very different than what would show up on your phone, perhaps. Whereas they're beginning with a model that gets delivered to both of our phones. And then it's, like you said, it's fine-tuning around the edge. But at the same time, they're collecting weights back from each of us, right? To improve that overall model that they send out with a new phone. Is that, do I have a good understanding of that? My understanding in the Google phone keyboard, that's how that phone works, where the, the Google phone keyboard collects data, but doesn't send the data back to the cloud, but it trains or updates the internal model and then sends the updated weight 
to the cloud so that a centralized model can be updated. And then they use that centralized updated model across to, to broadcast updates to, to many different mobile phones. This particular case, you see, it's, this is a great example of federated learning where the training is happening on, on the device. When Google first announced federated learning, they actually used the, the Google phones as, as, as examples. This was a, a few years ago. So it initially was only with the Google phone. It may or may not have expanded to, to non-Google phones. And I'm not trying to, you know, drill too much into Google specifically. I'm just, in general, these kinds of models can get updated, customized or fine-tuned at the edge. In some cases, end-user people, consumers, are actually doing the work, right? <laughs> I may be saying, yes, this is accurate, or no, this is not accurate, you know, and actually helping improve that model. That's correct, yeah. I will just ask you what your opinion is on what sorts of things need to be contemplated from a policy and privacy standpoint? I know you're not a lawyer and, and not an expert in this area, but just as a researcher who you know deals with AI on a daily basis, as we start aggregating, as the world starts aggregating information and then creating models that can then get rented out or farmed out or purchased, you know, what do we do about the fact that a lot of the data that's collected is sort of on the edge of personal data or, you know, people are contributing the data, but are they not receiving a profit back from the data? They may then have to purchase to get the insights. How are we looking at all? How is the community discussing this right now? You know, what kinds of things are people talking about in the inner circles of AI around this concept? There are some examples of AI generating beautiful art or amazing music, things that you would have thought it would be impossible 10 years ago. And one of the things that people used to differentiate, oh, this is an area just exclusive for humans, but yet AI has breached into this area. However, the training of these models is with human content. So with music that human artists wrote and and yet i am i'm not sure if the human artists are getting any compensation for their work being used to train these new ai models or similar in in the art field i don't know if the artists are, are getting any any compensation and another interesting area is generating visual images of actual people. So you could potentially generate a, a, a movie with actors that are virtual actors, but very realistically represent real actors. And should the real actors be compensated for, for that? But, but one area that, that I am quite concerned is on personalized content. So it is great when I go to Netflix or Amazon and they know what I like and they predict that I'm going to want. I think that part is good. What I find potentially dangerous is when it comes to like news sources or, or media content that is extremely personalized to me that reinforces my beliefs rather, rather than challenging them. And, and you can see how society can become quite divided when you are always being fed what you already believe and you start questioning very much the sanity of others that have different viewpoints but yet everybody is constantly being fed what they already believe and so i i i, I see this as as dangerous because it, it can break the empathy in people towards those that, that have different viewpoints. And I think over the past century, we've, we've done a tremendous job in, in breaking cultural barriers and becoming more united. But yet, I see this as, as a danger that can, that can divide us and not unite us. And I don't have a clean answer because it is very simple to design a model with the angle of maximizing click uh, clicks 
so or click through rate. So you can generate a model that for you, Camille, or for me, Andres, that that's going to maximize that you're going to click on particular articles. And of course, the articles that you're going to click are those that reinforce what, what you tend to believe. At least that's the case for most people. And to generate a model that takes that into account, but also exposes you to, to different viewpoints, it increases the complexity of the model and it's, it's harder to design. So I can see why many companies just design these simple models to maximize click-through rate. I do see uh, areas of concern with this approach. And then one more question for you is, how do you consider security, the relationship between deep learning and security? And I'll leave that pretty broad. So I see deep learning algorithms uh, being studied for, for various security applications. So how to apply deep learning to make your IT system more robust from hacker attacks. So that's in, in, in one area. As far as security in your own personal data, I think there's a lot of a uh, new algorithms and actual hardware features that can encrypt your data to prevent it from attackers that are trying to, to gather your data. And lastly, as you mentioned earlier, the work on federated learning where the data is kept on your device and doesn't have to trans be transferred to a centralized location. It's another area of, of increased uh, security. But I do see AI overall benefiting for many companies. I don't see it yet widely adopted. It is still in in, in early stages, uh, but in the early stages, it, it looks looks promising. Thank you, Andreas Rodriguez, fellow at Intel, who does specific work in deep learning and general guru of artificial intelligence and also author of a book on deep learning. Thank you so much for joining me today. Th thanks for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. Never miss an episode of What That Means with Camille by following us here on YouTube or search for In Technology wherever you get your podcasts. The views and opinions expressed are those of the guests and author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Intel Corporation. Mm -hmm.